Hello everybody. So today I'm just going to do a surprise episode, I guess you can call it, for the event a couple of days ago and kind of uh, cover the Apple September event and what was revealed there. Um, it, I really didn't have very high expectations for it, um, to be honest with you. And part of that is over the last couple of years, we've, we've seen some really big changes as far as to the iPhone and the Apple Watch. So like two years ago, we had the iPhone 10, which got rid of the home button and uh, added OLED and a couple other really um, cool technology. And then last year with the Apple Watch as well, we had the big size update. So now the Apple Watch's uh, screen is slightly larger. What I'll say is there was a heavy burden on Apple when it came to selling folks a new Apple Watch and a new iPhone. On top of that, there was the uh, services event back in March, which didn't go for very well. And so this was their chance to basically tell folks um, some actual prices and some actual dates. And so let's get started with that. So that was kind of the big reveal at the event was some actual pricing and dates when it comes to Apple Arcade and TV Plus. Um, from a business standpoint, there really isn't a lot to cover, but there is one thing I wanted to get into was whether this kind of subscription pricing for games is going to carry on to the App Store. I think that's really interesting. Um, games have a pretty bad reputation on iOS because of the gamification situation, sort of loot box game uh, gambling kind of atmosphere of in-app purchases and games, which uh, Apple has really benefited from. And I think they're trying to get away from that. They're trying to get quality games. Uh, it's interesting they showcased Konami and Capcom, which is a former uh, Nintendo video gamer. Um, well, still a Nintendo video gamer, but back in the 80s and 90s, Konami and Capcom are big names. So it's they're definitely trying to get that reputation going at the event. So it'd be interesting to see if they're going to do something like this with apps. You'd kind of want to say no, um, because the games are kind of more of an entertainment type situation. But um, it is interesting to see that they're have adopting some sort of subscription model when it comes to games. And it makes sense. Uh, the other thing is like games have a lot more of a production uh, to them as opposed to apps, which are more uh, marketing and uh, programming developers heavy. Uh, whereas games, there's got to be like a lot of graphics work, a lot of 3D audio, that kind of stuff. And it makes sense. It's much more along the lines of a movie um, or a TV show in that sense. Um, speaking of which, we have TV+. Plus. Um, I had figured they have to sell it pretty low to make it worthwhile to folks. And it seems like that's what they did. Um, we have now uh, TV Plus at $4.99, which I think is fairly reasonable for people who really um, like streaming services and watch a lot of video. I, I think it's, it's doable. Also, we have the one year of free Apple TV Plus with the... Uh, purchase of, I want to say an iPhone, maybe like an iPad and a Mac. I haven't totally, it hasn't been totally clear to me as far as what specifically you have to purchase to get that one year free. Um, for me, like the challenge, like I'm not interested in adding another streaming service. Um, so Disney is $7.99, I want to say, but it's even cheaper if you buy it for a few years. Um, that we're definitely considering because, I mean, I have a family of children so that makes total sense that's a reasonable deal for a great uh set a library uh, you know 100 years worth of movies and big names it makes sense for me but for something like apple tv plus um i just i don't need to add more tv to my life uh so that is kind of a hard sell for me um and also a lot of these TV shows and movies are a big risk. Like, see, sure, had a fantastic trailer, but we'll see if it's any actual 
actually any good. I mean, I, I hope it is, honestly, but um, that's that's a big risk for consumers to take. Um, so I think if you're already pretty much in the Apple ecosystem and you already watch a lot of streaming, five ninety nine doesn't like was that sixty bucks a year? That's not not a hard sell to make. Uh, and then if you're gonna buy a new iPhone, like you got it for a year right there. So um, I think they did a really good job on those two fronts. I don't have a lot to cover when it comes to the iPad. It's a new iPad. I think they're really trying to sell these. Um, I'm curious as to why they don't sell older iPads. Uh, I think there's a market for that, but where, whereas with the iPhone, you know, they have the iPhone 8 still uh, in the store. There is no older iPad, older, cheaper iPad, but I guess that's what the used market is for. Um, I don't have a lot to say about the new iPad. I think the issues with the iPad are much more in the app ecosystem than they are um, with the hardware itself. I think the hardware is excellent and has a great, um, it's really good quality and uh, they're definitely trying to make it a cheaper laptop alternative. And I think what really is missing is the app ecosystem, not the hardware. The hardware is top notch and the price is certainly reasonable, even 330, I think. Is it too much to ask um, for an iPad? So as far as like a consumer device, as, uh, when, I mean that in the strictest sense of like as a consumption device, I think it totally works. So that that's all I got to say about the iPad. Um, again, going back, it's a lot of this like app ecosystem stuff that I think is the biggest issue more than it is anything else. Um, and trying to get people to pay a reasonable price for a good app. So that carries into the Apple Watch. If they were gonna make any feature, make me want to buy a new Apple Watch, always on is certainly it. Um, I'm still gonna hold off this year. Don't hold me to it, but I'm gonna hold off on getting a new Apple Watch. But I think the always on feature is really, really good. Um, and I think it it's one of my biggest pet peeves peeves as a Apple Watch user is the fact that I have to like turn my wrist just wrist just the right way in order to uh, see what's going on uh, and when my hands are busy that's not really all that great and easy to do. I will say that um, we will get into the iPhone in a bit but I will say that the one Thing that's going to continue to improve the Apple Watch is the battery. I feel like with the battery and obviously processor speed helps as well, but I think battery is battery technology keeps getting better and processor technology keeps getting better. That's like pretty much what the watch hinges on hinges on is the uh, improvements with battery and processor, but mostly battery as the battery gets better. Uh, we're going to see improvements in all sorts of spaces. Uh, that's going to be like Wi-Fi, cell connection, uh, processor speed, etc. So with the Apple Watch, I think you're going to continue to see a lot of improvements um, to the app infrastructure because of the fact that it has more battery power and they're going to add more features to each of these watches. Um, if you're going to watch a device get improve over the next few years, it's the watch. I would definitely check that out. Um, and it's going to become a much better place for apps to be built and a much more welcoming piece of hardware, essentially, for that. So lastly, I want to talk about the iPhone. And again, we're seeing kind of a stabilization year in a sense that the three years ago or two years ago, we had iPhone 8, iPhone 8 Plus, and iPhone 10, and iPhone 10 was kind of the top-notch, high-priced device. And last year was a kind of a transition where the uh, iPhone XR, which was the iPhone 10, but with a few missing features, was developed. And that was kind of sold as the more reasonably priced phone. And then we see the iPhone um, and the iPhone XS and XS Max were kind of sold as the more high-quality device. So this year we see that iPhone 11. So notice that the iPhone 11 has the more normal moniker, which is similar to kind of the iPhone 8 was ten, uh, two years ago. And then we have the iPhone 11 Pro, which is taking on the role of the 10s and taking the role of the 10 two years ago as the more premium phone. 
uh, with a Pro Max and a regular Pro. And um, if there is any year where that differentiation becomes even more difficult to see, um, it's this year because uh, iPhone 11, so it's got two lenses, which is basically what the 10s has. And as well, it also, so it has LCD as opposed to OLED, but then like, I don't know if OLED has really shown to be worth the price. Um, and so what they've done with the Pro is they've added another lens and they've certainly spent a lot of time uh, showing off the capabilities of photography. And that's really what the Pro has become is like, what is the Pro part of it other than photography? And I'm not like discrediting that, but I think that it's really a pro only in the sense of that space, that sort of photography space. Like the processor is the same. The display is not as high quality, I guess, as the OLED, um, but still pretty darn good in the iPhone 11. You know, what's the differentiation? It's really all photography. And I wonder like if you're already somebody who's into photography, would you already have a second device? I am certainly in the market, like I bought last year an iPhone XS precisely because of the photography features that are on the XS as opposed to the XR. But like if I was gonna wait till this year, I, I don't know what I would do, uh, if it would be worth me getting a Pro as opposed to a, a 11. Um, so that's really it. So things I wanted to talk about uh, primarily as far as the event is concerned is one thing is this kind of slowdown and in innovation as far as the iPhone. I certainly think we're going to have a big bump maybe in the next couple of years getting rid of the notch. Um, maybe foldable phones, I guess. I don't know. I feel like that's still down the road. I'm trying to think what other innovations we might see in the next couple of years. But it's, we're never going to be, these innovations are going to become less frequent and less, um, having less momentum. What this indicates to me is kind of a maturity in the smartphone market. I'd compare this to where uh, PCs were maybe like 15 years ago, where each, um, like, processors weren't really getting that much faster. There were still big boxes hooked up to monitors and keyboards and mice. There wasn't a lot of innovation uh, when it comes to PCs and there really still hasn't been that amount of innovation. Uh, LCD monitors, SSDs, I'm just trying to think of what came out 15 years ago. After that, like we haven't seen a lot. And what that means, I think, is that more accessibility, uh, bigger audience of people who are gonna have decent premium phones uh, to do stuff with. And I think if you're a company that doesn't have an app, A, think about whether it's worthwhile, but B, um, more, more from a business sense, if it's worthwhile. But as far as like a device that people have and will have access to, uh, I think you have a certain case, uh, certainly a case there to where, um, developing an app is going to last for a few years and also is going to reach a significant number of people. Um, this maturity in the market, I think, definitely indicates that, that like, as far as developing for a device, iPhones and uh, Androids, I would include, um, just they're mature, they're mature devices, they're not gonna, there's not going to be a lot of big change hardware wise, that is going to affect your app. Um, and I think now is a great opportunity to take advantage of that. Um, then also, as far as the Apple Watch, I think that if you haven't at least thought about developing an app for the Apple Watch, I think now is the time to at least to think about it. Um, how does your business fit in that space? How would an Apple Watch work? And um, you may not even need to make an app. Maybe you just need to make more robust notifications on your device. But I think it's certainly something to think about is whether, um, whether maybe a watch is a good fit. If you do anything, notification, location, uh, anything with like where communication can be done fairly simply uh, and of course last but not least health or fitness i would say spend some time thinking about whether an apple watch is the right thing to do uh concerning the ipad like ipad os i think it, well we'll get into the ios 13 i think it's certainly something worth talking about tony had asked that question on twitter um let's just get into that right now so 
did uh, Tony's question on Twitter was, did they have, do they take on more than they can chew essentially? Uh, one of the big problems is, um, so we've got iPad OS, for instance, um, iPad OS is a, uh, is kind of their marketing differentiation from iOS and the iPhone. And it seems like there's some stuff there where they're trying to make the iPad a more professional device. And I think they're certainly making a lot of inroads in the OS. I think they're like 60 to 80% there as far as that's concerned. But like I said, the big concern with the iPad, I think was much more the app infrastructure and the app ecosystem that is there for professional apps. So going back, um, that's one thing I think has been a big challenge with iOS 13. So iPad OS won't be out until the 30th of September and iOS 13 will be out on the 19th. So it's interesting to see uh, what they're gonna end up doing with that um, and how iPad OS is gonna work on 13.1. I guess it's gonna be that release. Um, the other thing I think is iCloud. The iCloud stuff um, has been a real pain in the neck. Um, I upgraded to iCloud and it's been a mess under the beta, um, and that is certainly one feature that they've bit off more than they can chew. And then um, lastly, I want to say uh, Catalyst, Swift UI. A lot of those um, UI changes that they've made have been a real issue. Uh, as a developer, it's much more noticeable to me, um, but there has been some real challenges for developers trying to get apps working with the Swift UI and Catalyst um, and trying to get those APIs working. So yeah, iPad OS, uh, iCloud, and Swift UI and Catalyst have been the biggest challenges as far as uh, iOS 13. I think that's it. I, so like big takeaways, maturity of the iPhone, we're not gonna see big updates. Maybe next year we'll see 5G and maybe we'll see a few other things, continued waterproofing, things like that. But like the iPhone is pretty much, and the smartphone I would say in general has pretty much matured. We might see um, a couple of great innovations in the next five years, but it's slowed down. Um, where I think we're gonna see a lot more innovation is gonna be on the watch. And, you know, AR glasses, I guess, are gonna come or whatever their Google Daydream alternative might come. We've seen that leaked. Um, I was disappointed no tile, no Apple tile, but there really isn't a lot as far as businesses are concerned with that. So I'm not gonna mention that. Um, as far as services, it's interesting seeing that we have a subscription service for apps, essentially, which are the games, but games are essentially apps. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if they do anything more with that. Um, iPad continues to try to be their laptop, cheaper laptop alternative. Um, and I think they could do a lot in that space and I think it's gonna continue to grow. Uh, Apple Watch, that's where innovation is gonna be in the next uh, decade. And if you have not considered building an app uh, for the watch, at least consider it. Talk to me. Um, I'll just uh, close by saying thanks for joining me. Uh, if you are looking for some help uh, with any of this stuff, uh, iPhone and certainly Apple Watch, uh, reach out to me. You can reach out to me on Twitter at Leo G. Dion. Um, also on LinkedIn, Leo Dion. And uh, you can also email me, leo at brightdigit.com. Thank you for joining me for this episode. And we will be back to our regularly scheduled programming next week. Goodbye.